Wiggle, 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 wiggle. Okay, okay, we have another slight problem. Dr. Nature's miracle elixir works the wonders The next talk is supposed to be being given by some great old Freeman, but he's disappeared again. So I think it's going to be given by the little Barry Pascal. Uh, if you remember, or I'm Pendak, uh, last year we were talking about this guy, Freeman. Yes, we were talking about him here. And uh, can you remember what we found out about him? Yes, so we found out that um, he drank quite a lot and he could get violent. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I remember that. Now, uh, have you found out anything else in the intervening 12 months? Yes, I found out that he's uh, very fond of, shall we say, ladies of negotiable affection. <laughs> and last time I saw him, he was, he was out the back of the car park with some cheap strumpet. So you won't be seeing him any time soon, I can tell you. But he, he's, he's prepared a written statement, apparently. So let me read what he says. <coughs> this is not as testy as Rata. This is what he says. Your words are empty, hollow bleatings of a mental crutch. They're open, festered indigestion with a velvet touch. An ether-eating Eskimo would gag upon your sight, convulsed into oblivion from laughter or from fright. A coma with a sweet aroma is your only dream, malignant with the misconception that a grunt can gleam. Your lichen-covered corpuscles are filthy to my fist. Infection is your finest flower, mildewed in the mist. What was that all about? I don't know, a lot of shite if you ask me. <laughs> right, David, uh, this day or day, can I use this little device to uh, Work it, or do you have to work it? Uh, we have to do it. You have to work it. The less, the less I have to do with technology, the better, to be frank. That's what we thought. <laughs> yeah. Several years ago, my uh, colleague Adam Davis had been on the track of the Yeti in Tibet, and <coughs> he was talking to Ian Redmond, a field biologist and conservationist who had mentioned to him that there were numerous reports of the Yeti in the northern <coughs> Indian state of Meghalaya. Upon returning, he uh, investigated some more and got in touch with a journalist called Dipu Marek, who had been on the trail of this creature for some years. Now, I too had heard of this uh, uh, Indian Yeti, or as it's known locally, the Mandai Burung, which means the forest man. So, uh, we had come back recently from <coughs> the Sumatran expedition, and discussing what we wanted to do next, we thought that uh, the Indian Yeti might be a very good idea. Uh, in uh, June of 2008, the BBC journalist Alastair Lawson visited the area to investigate sightings. And uh, he was impressed by the re remoteness and the, the undisturbed nature of the land. <coughs> he said, if ever there was terrain where a peace-loving Yeti could live its life undisturbed by human interference, it surely got to be it. Perhaps the most famous reporting sighting was on April 2002, when a forestry office, officer, James Marek, was among a team of 14 officials carrying out a census of tigers in Balpakra when they saw what they thought was a yeti. Now, some hairs had been given uh, to the BBC uh, by, by Dipu Marek, and who thought they may belong to the yeti. In fact, they, they turned out to be from a goral, which is a, a type of uh, antelope. But we decided uh, we, would, we would go up uh, to Megalea and uh, get on the track of the Indian Yeti. And uh, as well as myself and Adam Davis, there was uh, Dr. Chris Clark, Dave Archer, and um, John McGowan on his very first CFZ expedition. So, on, funnily enough, on Halloween 2010, we flew out to India to. Uh, Delhi, and then from, from there to 
Butawate in Assam. Now, uh, the state of Meghalaya uh, used to be part of Assam, and it was carved out of Assam in the early 70s. In fact, in 1972, uh, to cater for really the, um, the the needs of the hill tribes up in, uh, up in the mountains there, who are quite distinct from other Indians. Their their ancestry lies in Tibet, so they look much more Oriental than uh, than, than other Indians. We have the next slide. Please. That is a reconstruction by Dipu based on um, eyewitness accounts. Dipu himself has never seen the Mande Burung. He's found immense man like tracks about 19 inches long. And he's talked to a lot of eyewitnesses, but he's never seen it himself. But based on eyewitness accounts, this is what the creature looks like. It's supposed to be 3 metres, 10 feet tall, which um, squares up well with the larger kind of yeti reported from places like Tibet where it's known as the duste, or hulking thing. I thought I heard somebody laugh then. What's so funny about hulking thing? <laughs> now the expedition was somewhat atypical for us. Uh, can we have the next uh, slide? Uh, that, that, that's one of our guides. You see what I mean? That, um, that is um, Rudy Sandman. He's one of our, one of our one of the guides in the area. He's holding the skull of a great Indian hornbill. You can see that Rudy doesn't look Indian. He looks more Oriental. And he says he's constantly being mistaken for someone from Indochina or something like that. But he's actually Indian by nationality, but his ancestry lies in Tibet. <coughs> it's a very atypical expedition for us. Because usually we go deep into the jungle or the desert or the mountains or wherever we're going and we camp out and rough it and live cheek in jowl with nature. Uh, but the Indian government wouldn't let us, uh, <coughs> wouldn't let us camp due to uh, some insurgents being in the area. Now there were a couple of insurgent groups. One of them had, had had a ceasefire and the other one, uh, there, was, there was only a handful of them and they weren't really aggressive to Westerners. They just didn't like Bengalis. They wanted uh, Meghalaya to become a separate country because they're culturally separate to the rest of India. So they weren't really dangerous, but the government was a bit twitchy about it. So we had to stay in tourist lodges on the edge of the jungle, which I've, I always feel like cheating a bit. I like to go <coughs> and have total immersion when I'm in the jungle or the desert or wherever. So um, <coughs> it's quite atypical. Yeah, the, the Garrow National Liberation Army, they, they sound like, power to the people! Who remembers Wolfie Smith? <laughs> Can we have the next slide, please? And now, uh, Rudy, en route up into the mountains, uh, we got talking, we, we um, struck up a conversation. And he was telling me about other creatures that are supposed to, that are supposed to live in the area. It happens almost all the time in every expedition we go on. We, we go looking for one creature and we find information on other creatures, oftentimes things we've never ever heard about. <clears throat> and up in the, in the Garrow Hills there's a tradition of this creature called the Sankuni. And it's described as an immense black snake with a red crest on its head, not unlike that of a rooster, and wattles coming down from the bottom jaw. It's associated with rainfall, and it's also associated with landslides. <coughs> if this sounds familiar, it should. Back in the year 2000, the year of the dragon, I was out in Thailand searching for something called the Naga, which is uh, a creature widespread in the mythology of both India and Indochina which once again <coughs> is described as an immense snake with a rooster-like crest on its head and black scales associated with rain and rainfall. Uh, in 2006, uh, <coughs> for my sins, I was in the Gambia uh, looking for a creature called the Ninkananka, which the locals described as a huge snake with a crest on its head associated with rainfall. So again and again, you see this motif repeated. 
Uh, can we have the next slide? Another creature from the local folklore was called the Skarl. And it's a vampiric entity that resembles a human being by night. It's not by day, but by night, the head detaches from the body and it flies around as an independent entity looking for blood to suck. It has luminous hair and luminous saliva. And it will cause its victim to become ill and weaken and finally die. Now, there are very similar things found elsewhere in Asia and the folklore of other Asian countries. Uh, in Malaya, they have the Penangalan. In the Philippines, they have the Mananganal. The Balinese have the Liak. The, the Thais have the Karus. And the Japanese have the uh, Nekakubi. And they're all these creatures where the head detaches and goes flying off to suck the blood of the living. It may be a, um, a way of describing diseases uh, by, by uh, peoples in the past who didn't understand uh, about disease and when someone caught a disease and they became weak and they died they blamed it on this creature, the skull and the actual luminous hair and luminous saliva may be uh, something like ball lightning that we don't understand but it's strange how you see these motifs again and again and again <coughs> well we drove up these <coughs> ever increasingly uh, increasingly twisting and winding and, and rough roads to the <coughs> spectacularly ugly and depressing mountain town of Tura where we met Dipu Marek who was the man who had been on the trail of the Mandeva room for so many years and he was a, a delightful man, an infectious passion for the Yeti and a great interest in it. <coughs> um, the actual town itself was, like I said, spectacularly ugly uh, it had some reasonable hotels in it. Uh, it only had one bar, which closed at 10 o'clock. And, uh, well, it actually closed at quarter to 10. And the guy that ran it was not in the least interested in keeping it open any longer, no matter how many people were in it. <clears throat> On top of that, there were three places to eat in this, this, this um, town. Uh, two of the hotels have restaurants. <clears throat> but the service was mind warpingly bad. You would ask for, say, a, a, a can of pop, a soft drink. An hour later, it wouldn't have arrived, and there would be three men standing like that, next to the fridge, with the pop in it. You would ask for soup. Your soup would come after an hour. You'd ask for roll to go with the soup. The roll would come an hour later. You'd look on the menu and then there would be various, uh, various tasty sounding dishes that you would ask for and oh no, we haven't got that. No, that's off. We don't have that. Does anybody remember the cheese shop sketch from Monty Python? <laughs> Venezuelan beaver cheese. Um, <coughs> they didn't have anything. The service was spectacularly bad. In fact, it was so bad that at both of these restaurants, on, on one occasion, we decided to uh, go to a, a third restaurant up above a mall. And uh, the service there wasn't terribly good, but it was a damn sight better than the, the, the hotels. And we'd ordered some pizza and, and fruit juice, and the waiter brought it round and then sneezed all over it oh. and gave it to us. <laughs> also, a great advertisement for this eatery, straight outside the door of it, was a bucket full of diarrhoea <laughs> advertising this wonderful eatery. So, Tora was fairly depressing, but uh, Dipu himself was a, was a wonderful man. Now, the, the, follow, uh, the following day, we journeyed to Nokrek National Park. Can I have the next slide, please? There, that's a, a GV of Nokrek. Um, it's not a well-known national park. It's a massive centre for biodiversity, but very few people go there. Also, it's one of the most poorly inhabited places in, in the whole of India. The population is very low in this area. It consists of hills, valleys, deep jungle. Uh, the ancestor of all the citrus fruit comes from this particular area. And there have been a number of sightings of the Mande Burung here. Uh, Deepu was telling us about uh, a man up in the mountains who had a farmer who had a, a field full of pineapples and he'd seen a family of these creatures 
Uh, two adults, a male and a female, a male standing about three metres or ten feet tall, smaller female, and then uh, two youngsters who were digging up pineapples, eating them. And he wanted to shoot at them, but his wife wouldn't let them, and then they ran off through the hills. So he decided to set some camera traps up in this area. So he went out into the jungle, uh, quite arduous trek into the rainforest, climbing up and down these ridges. Uh, at one point, we came across a small cave in the side of a cliff, and uh, John McGowan and others had a look in, but it wasn't terribly large. So we set up our camera traps, and, and we decided to leave them there, and come back at the end of the expedition to pick them up, to, to give a decent amount of time for them to pick up anything. And we left out fruit in the area to see if we could attract the creature. From then on, we moved from Tura to down, which is in the West Garrows, uh, down into Siju in the South Garrows. Can I have the next? Um... Oh, that's, that was one of the tourist lodges. You see, I don't like using pictures. I always get ahead of myself. I forget what I've got. That was one of the tourist lodges we stayed in, rather than camping like we usually do. And it's, it's made to look like a traditional Garrow house. Uh, it's on, on stilts like that. Um, we stopped there, and Morgan and Tara, who came with us a little later on, they were up in a lot of concrete tree house. You had to go up a ladder to go to. I wasn't glad I wasn't in there. But it was really quite snug and cosy. And uh, at one point, we'd taken some chickens. Uh, to, uh, we brought some live chickens in the market to eat. We took them with us. I gave them all names. Uh, uh, little Lofty, Gloria, and Mr. Lardy Dark and Graham who were all characters out of the tank half off. <laughs> and uh, one night, uh, one night Rudy, who, who was like the chief, chief guide, he said it, it, in the morning something had been pushing against the side of the, the side of the uh, building, pushing against the, the, the wall. And I, I got up in the middle of the night to use the toilet, and I heard something moving around, but fairly large. Uh, I assumed it was a, a, a cow or a goat or a pig that had wandered down from the little village. Um, Rudy seemed to think it might have been a tiger that had been attracted by the live chickens, but we, we found no, no trap for anything, so whether it was a tiger or not, I don't know. Uh, can we have the next uh, slide, please? That's another GV of uh, Knockrack. Next one, please. Another GV of Knockrack. Next one. Ah, yes. We went down to uh, a little a place called Siju, where they have one of the largest cave systems in the whole of India. And uh, we decided to take a look in these caves because a, a local headman had said he'd heard something and seen huge footprints in these caves. Next one, please. There are some stalactites in the caves. We only went a, 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 you know, a few hundred yards into these caves, but apparently they go on for miles and they've got multiple entrances. Uh, one of the reasons we think the Mande Barun might go in there is that it's quite cool. <coughs> so if you wanted to, in, in the heat, if you wanted to cool off, you could go into these caves. Uh, next, please. That's some fat gear. I tell you what, um, Bill Bailey's really let himself go, hasn't he? <laughs> Next one, please. Yeah. There's a fruit bat. There's, a, there's lots of water in there, too. That's a, that's a fruit bat there. There's a whole nest of fruit bats. Next one, please. The large spider we saw in the CGK. And the next one, please. That's a uh, freshwater shrimp in the cave. Just an no idea to get what these things were in the cave. Uh, the fruit bats, we found a couple of recently dead ones. And John McGowan, who's a Taxidermist decided he wanted to take them back with him and preserve them for his natural history museum. So we took them back to the little lodge we were staying in in the village, and uh, he skimmed them. And the guides cooked up the meat for us, and we ate it. We didn't kill these bats; they were, they were already dead. They were newly, freshly dead. Uh, and you don't get an awful lot of meat off a of bat, even a fruit bat. You're not going to get an awful lot of meat off it. But I can say I've eaten, I've eaten fruit bat now, I can add that to my list of exotic 
animals I've eaten, including the endangered Mekong catfish, quite by accident, I hasten to that. But that tasted lovely, sort of like palm of vine. Um, Cameron, which tasted a bit like chicken, and uh, Gnu, which tasted like pork. Fruit bat, I thought, tasted a bit like rabbit. Anyway, I digress. Uh, next, uh, yeah. whilst we were in the cave, we came across actually one of the one of the guys called Pim Pim Chu. I found this part of the leg bone, and looking at it in the cave, I thought it was animal leg bone. So we took it out into the light, and John McGowan noted the shape of it looked like a biped, and it did indeed look like the leg bone of some bipedal animal. Now there are only two bipedal animals in the area: humans and the Manday Barung. Now, if it was a Monday room, it wasn't a very big one. It would have been a, a juvenile. I thought, from the word go, it's probably going to be a human leg bone. But just to be sure, we would take it back with us. Can we have the next one, please? Now, <clears throat> this gentleman here, he was the head man of the village. Uh, his name was Gentile. And uh, several years before, he'd been badly frightened by something in the caves. He and some friends had been fishing by the light of burning torches when they heard a noise that he described as sounding like someone treading on bamboo, a sort of crunching noise. When they investigated, they found huge footprints, wet footprints, um, on rock, as if something had been wading through uh, the water in the caves and then stepped out onto the rocks human-like, but of a vast size. And they led off down one of the, the main passages from the, from the tunnel. And the group thought it was a Monday room. And they could hear something moving about. They didn't actually see it. They heard something big moving about. They all panicked and fled. And he hasn't been back since, to, to the cave since. I found, thought it was quite odd why, why the animal would be so near human habitation, so near a village. But if it had gone into the cave to take advantage of the stable cave temperature, it might have actually got lost and come out of a, another entrance. It, 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 may, it may have gone into an entrance miles away in the jungle, got lost, was blundering around in the dark and came out close to human habitation. Or it could have gone there, down there possibly to hunt for freshwater crabs. They had been seen, the mainly thought to be herbivores, but occasionally there were reports of hunting for freshwater crabs. And the following day, we went across this uh, huge suspension bridge. Could you uh, take that? Oh, oh that's, uh, yeah, I forgot all about that. That was uh, John and Dave going tarantula fishing. In a, there was a little wall near the village, and they coaxed out a tarantula uh, by, by, with a stick. And we got managed to get a photograph of it. We didn't see any big animals, but there was lots of... Lots of small things like lizards and tarantulas and other bizarre insects. Next, uh, yeah, there's a suspension bridge. <coughs> we went across this huge suspension bridge, and it reminds me of one of those things you'd see in the old Johnny Wiseman Tarzan films. When you're going across it, it starts to rock from side to side. <coughs> you really do feel that you've, you've made it to India, that the real, the real wilds of India when you're on this thing, and it, <coughs> it um, led across to the jungle on the other side and <clears throat> we had a sort of uh, some time on our hands so we decided to fish at the bird sanctuary on, on the other side and when we they, they said oh, there's a bird sanctuary on the other side we just thought it would be a couple of acres in the jungle in fact we went on this incredibly arduous trek through the forest that lasted ages and ages and ages and one of the most interesting places we came across was some natural limestone formations. Um, can we have the next slide? Yeah, that's a simulacrum of a face. There were all these weird limestone outcroppings that looked very like a castle and, and ruins and stuff. But they were all actually natural formations made by rain and wind and things like that. And they reminded me of um, the cold lairs in Rudyard Kipling's um, Jungle Books, where the Bandar Law, the monkey tribe, Take Mowgli to. Has anybody actually read the Jungle Books? Good. Right. Who's seen the Disney film? <laughs> Gouge your eyes out. 
Forget the Disney film, forget everything about it. It bears no relationship to Kipling's wonderful literature. If you get the chance, read the Jungle Books. There are two of them. They're amongst the finest books written in the English language. And Disney bastardised them like it does with so many great things, so many great literature, so many wonderful books are completely screwed by Disney. And I have a passionate, deep and abiding loathing of them. <coughs> but this, this is sort of straight out of Kipling. And uh, there was one area, one area uh, that they called the Tiger's Passage, where there were, <coughs> it was a, a narrow passage through the rocks. Um, the rocks were very tall on either side, very smooth, and you could only go one abreast in them. And up until ten years ago, there was a man-eating tiger there that would wait, because he knew you had to walk one abreast down this passage, and you couldn't climb the walls. And they would wait there and grab, grab people and eat them. Up until about ten years ago. We found the tracks of elephant, sambo, other animals, we went to a watering hole and I, I checked for anything that might be remotely resembling a uh, <coughs> man-made room footprint, but we couldn't find anything. Tracks of lots of other animals, but not the man room. The paradox of the jungle, and I found this in every rainforest I've been in, despite having the, the highest biodiversity in the world, the animals are hard to see. Because literally, you can't see the wood for the trees. They can hear you coming from a long way off, because all the trees are in the way. You very rarely get to see anything. Uh, now, like I say, the, the largest animals we saw in the jungle here were, were some birds and frogs. Although there were traces of much, much bigger ones. Uh, Dave Archer, who had stayed down by the river, actually found the prints of a lot of a, um, what seemed to be a female tiger in the sand down by the river. Uh, can we have the next slide? Moving on, we heard of uh, a village where uh, a couple of people are supposed to have had experiences with the Mande Burung. <coughs> also, in the, the jungle beyond the village, there was supposed to be a simulacrum of Mande Burung footprint. So we, we trekked into this different part of the jungle. And we did, in, in fact, find this huge footprint-like mark. But like I say, it's a simulacrum. It has nothing to do with the real Mandate Barum. It's just <coughs> a depression in the rock, a natural one, that happens to look just like a huge footprint. <coughs> but it's interesting that it, it's been associated with the Mandate Barum because it suggests that the knowledge of it or the idea of this huge bipedal creature, which leaves this huge track, uh, has been around for quite some time. So it was worth going to see. Uh, like I say, culturally interesting, but as it's nothing to do with the flesh and blood animal itself. Um, next. Uh, now, uh, this, this, um, this was a local man. Uh, if you look on his right hand there, he's got two thumbs. This gentleman, uh, in his youth, had heard the man made the in the forest. Uh, he hadn't actually seen it. He was hunting with his friends. He heard this awful bellowing roar and this crashing through the, through the jungle. And it's coming closer and closer. So he and his friends hid in a cave and they lit a large fire. And they were cowering in this cave while whatever this thing was was moving around outside, shrieking and bellowing, and, uh, <coughs> and until dawn when it moved away. And he went back to the village and asked the village elders. He was just a young man then. He asked the village elders, uh, "What was it that was, was making that noise?" But when he imitated the sound, the village elders told him that was the forest man. That was the Monday room. He never actually saw it there. He heard the noise, and he said that. Up until the 70s, they were more common than they are now. They're very rarely seen now. And you remember that a few years after he had that experience, um, a friend of his said that his father had shot one of these things. And he described it to him as looking like a, a huge man covered with black hair. But 
But now, he says, they're much rarer than they were before. Uh, can we have the... Uh, yeah. Oh, his name, incidentally. Oh, can we go back one? Yeah, I, 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 I lost them, the note of his name. His name was Shereng R. Marak. Marak is like Smith in the area. And many people are called, are called Marak. And he described the noise it made as a deep call. Oh, 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 like that. Which is interesting, because a lot of people who heard the Orang Pendek calling say it goes oh, 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 oh. these three noises or sometimes more drawn out at the end oh, 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 oh. Like and I've heard that noise up at Gunung Tuju but whatever this is it's much bigger than the Orang Pendek uh, next one the, the man in the middle there is Mecca Marek and he is a 77 year old shaman in the village of Imangre. And uh, he's now suffering from cataracts. But he made his living by making medicines and charms when he was younger. Um, back before the India Pakistan War of 1965, he had been searching for an incense tree out in the jungle. And he came upon some thick creepers that had been snapped by something large with immense strength. And he heard a crashing sound and turned around to see a huge yeti charging at him through the jungle. Now he pointed, we asked him how large it was, he pointed to the roof of a nearby tea house and said it was about the size of that. Now the roof of this tea house was 15 feet, which is a, um, a height I'm completely unable to accept. 10 feet maybe, but not 15 feet. But you've got to remember he's an old man now and he's got cataracts, so you want you know, to see the correct height of the of the, the top of the tea rooms. But he said it looked like a huge hair covered man. It had immense arms and hands and he said it could have broken someone's neck with just a twist of its wrist. And uh, <coughs> it absolutely terrified him and he, he fled fled from the jungle. Uh, to his credit, he didn't try to embellish anything, because it had been a long time since he saw it. We asked him, can you remember what colour it was? And he couldn't remember the colour of the fur. He didn't, he didn't make it up and say black, brown, or whatever, he just couldn't remember it. <coughs> um, he had seen the Sankuni, the giant snake as well, or so he says. Once again, prior to 1965, he saw the creature emerge from a cage, cage beside the Sam, Simsang River. He didn't see the whole animal, as he beat quite a hasty retreat, he saw 25 to, th to 30 feet of it emerging from the cave. He said it had black scales, a yellowish underbelly, a red rooster-like crest, and wattles on its lower jaw. So can we have the next... Uh... Our next port of call was a place called Balpakra, which was a very interesting place indeed. The local people, there's a great, uh, the, the, the local people believe that it's where the spirits of the dead go. And there have been uh, a number of alleged man neighbor room sightings there. And we were walking up through this scrubby grassland, and local farmers were burning it off, rather like they, they burn off stubble in, um, <coughs> in uh, the west, but I think they were burning it off to make more growth for, for grazing their livestock. And there were a lot of people about. I was thinking, there's no way that this place, there's going to be a big primate living in this place. There's just too many people, not enough cover for it. <coughs> it couldn't possibly be there. Anyway, on our way up, we saw this rather interesting formation here. And it's hexagonal, a little bit like um, the Giant's Causeway in Ireland. And it's apparently caused by um, lava rot, uh, lava cooling and cracking in a certain way to make these symmetrical patterns. And the local people call it the ghost market. They believe ghosts meet there and have their market there. <coughs> and as we walked across the, the, the plateau, thinking there's, there's, there's no way a, a large animal could live here, we came across a spectacular gorge. Can we have the next step? Uh... 
Oh, that's a vinegar room whip scorpion. I believe being handled. But is that Dave or is it? No, that's um, Dave. Is Dave? Is Dave another one? Is either Dave or, or John uh, handling the, the scorpion there, which we caught before we went up there? I forgot to put that in. It has nothing to do with the mandate or it was just a nice shot if you want the idea of the invertebrates in the area. Can we have the next one, please? There. Down in the background there is the gorge, Balpakram Gorge, and it's absolutely spectacular. It's seven miles wide. And, and one kilometre, and, and sorry, seven kilometres wide, one kilometre deep. And uh, it's an astounding spectacle because all around is more or less cultivated land or grassland. But down there's thick forest, and when we're told that you know, only one or two hunters venture into it every year, just one or two local people going to it, and it's highly undisturbed. So if there was anywhere around this area, Balpakro, where the Yeti could live, it would be in this gorge. But unfortunately, we didn't have time to go down into it. We'd have needed climbing equipment, or we'd have had to go all the way around and rented a canoe and gone in by a river. We just didn't have time to do it. But it, it looked like just the sort of place you might find a large primate. Uh, next picture, please. That's the team there by the gorge, and the next one. That's us back in Tora again. We had met up with uh, a local sculptor who was uh, <coughs> very interested in cryptozoology, and uh, he told us some stories he had heard about uh, the Sankuni. Uh, and its association with landslides. And I asked him, is it still seen today? He said, yes. Only a few years ago, there was a, a, a landslide and a woman's house was wrecked, and one of these enormous snakes was seen crawling away. And I'm thinking that maybe in the, in the monsoon weather, if, they, if they're if they underground, if they have their lairs underground, um, there's, a, there's a monsoon and a landslide, the creatures are disturbed and crawl away, crawls away, it gets the blame. For the landslide. Two totally separate things, but people believe it causes the landslide in its coils. Also, he said that uh, his father had told him that in the Second World War, around about 1944, in a lake uh, on the borders with Bangladesh, there was a Sankuni that had devoured a number of people. And <clears throat> so the story goes some heavily armed soldiers went out there and managed to kill it, uh, or just what kind of firearms they were using against a creature of this size, I don't know. But the story goes that when it finally succumbed to uh, the hail of bullets they sent at it, and it expired, part of it was in the lake and part of it was out of the lake. The part that was out of the lake was 60 feet long. So the whole animal, all told, was well over 60 feet if there's any truth to this story, but no one's gone back to look for bones. And once again, sadly, because we were pushed to time, we couldn't do this big detour to find this lake and dig around looking for bones and things, but it might be an interesting thing to go back, maybe with some of those things they use on um, Time Team, the uh, geophysics things, to see if there's any disturbance or any large bones around there. Uh, the, the, he reckoned that these creatures spent a lot of their time in tunnels under the ground and they emerged occasionally after rainfall. Anyway, <coughs> we went back to the delightful town of Turin again. Let me capture up on my head. <coughs> to interview some more local people who might be in the know. And the chap there, uh, second from the right, the little chap in the uh, with the with the, with bald head in there. White. Uh, he his uh, his name was Dr. Milton Sasama, and he was the Pro Vice Chancellor of Garrow Hills University. And he'd written a number of books on the folklore of the Garrow Hills, so we thought he might be uh, an interesting person to talk about, talk to about the Mandate Barum. Now he said in all of his studies, he'd never heard of the Mandate Barum. It just seemed to appear this thing that he describes like a giant orangutan around 20 years ago. There's no long-term folklore about it, so he, he thinks it doesn't exist. Um, and he also said there was no tradition of yeti-like animals in Assam, 
which is the Indian state that lies between the Garo Hills and the Himalayas. So he thought that basically uh, it was probably just a modern folkloric construction. Conversely, and quite surprisingly, he implicitly believed in the Sankuni. He said that there was a man who had actually eaten the flesh of a dead juvenile Sankuni when it had been washed into the village by a flood. It was between 12 and 20 feet long and wore a rooster-like crest. The meat from the carcass had, uh, had provided enough food for the whole village. The man, now in his 80s, was called Alvin Stone, and he lived in Tora. And that reminded me of a story I heard uh, back in 2005 when we were on the trail of the Mongolian death worm. We heard about dragon-like creatures living not only um, <coughs> in, in the, the um, mountains, but up in the north of the country. And one man had told us that his grandmother said that in her mountain village, in the north of Mongolia, a dead dragon had washed up in, in the village uh, one winter and had been frozen. It, it, it was dead and frozen under the ice. They couldn't see the head, they couldn't see the tail, but the section that they could see of it was scaly and about 100 feet long. And it was said that, that the whole village survived by eating the meat of this dead dragon, whatever it was, uh, all winter until the spring thaw, and it was much to the charring of scientists everywhere, whatever it was, was washed away. This is a very similar story, a bit on a much smaller scale. Unfortunately, we couldn't track down Alvin Stone. He was, uh, he was visiting relatives in another part of, uh, another part of uh, the Garrow Hills, so he wasn't there. Our next interviewee was Llewellyn Marrick, and he was the uncle of another one of our guides, a chap called Rufus, and he was a noted author of a number of books on the wildlife of the Garrow Hills. Can we have the next slide, please? There it is, that's uh, Llewellyn Marrick. <coughs> now, uh, he, had, he, once again, he hadn't seen the creature itself, the, the, the man named Warung, but he had seen its tracks around 21 kilometres from Tura at a place called Nokrek Peak. He found them in the sand beside a stream, and he said they were 18 inches long, and the tracks led away into the jungle. Llewellyn's um, father, sorry, grandfather, was a renowned hunter and collector of trophies. He had encountered the man named Barung on a hunting trip many years before and described it as looking like a colossal gorilla. And it was moving around on all fours as if it was foraging for something. It didn't see him, and he watched it for a while, became very scared and backed away. Um, and when, when Llewellyn asked him if it was a bear, he was adamant it was not a bear. He said, like a huge gorilla. Now, whilst we were talking to him, we were taking a look at all his grandfather's trophies, hunting trophies, and uh, eagle-eyed John McGowan picked something out that looked very strange. Can we have the next... Um... There were some antlers of what looked like a kind of deer called a muntjac. Now, are we familiar with muntjac? Do we know what they are? Anybody know, not know what a muntjac is? Good. Muntjacs are a small species of deer. They never get much bigger, usually, than about like that. You get them wild in this country, they're introduced. Now, the one on the left is an ordinary muntjac. The one on the right looks like muntjac horns, but they were massively bigger. Bigger even than the giant muntjac from Vietnam, which we discovered a few years ago. And uh, John thought these might constitute a new species of colossal muntjac. So he asked about them. And apparently, locally, the deer is very rare. It's called a machek. But they know about it, but it's very rare. <coughs> so we decided to take some samples so we could have the DNA tested at Copenhagen University by our good friend Lars Thomas and Dr. Tom Gilbert. So we were very excited at the possible prospect of a new species of deer. And like I said before, we go looking for one thing, and we turn up all these other menagerie of strange animals, or stories thereof, in this area. Can we have the next slide, please? All on the same day... Um, oh, I've lost my... Yeah. 
Yes, sorry. But on the same day, we met this man, and he was talk called Dr. Lau. Um, and he had shot a strange animal up on uh, Tora Peak, and he showed us the pelt of it, and it was the pelt of a red panda. They're not all that closely related to the giant panda, they're more closely related to raccoons. But they, they are the original pandas, they were given the name panda before the giant panda. Uh, in China they're called fire foxes. But they were completely unknown from the area. He shot that in the, fifth, in the, sorry, in the 60s. So that, although it's like a known species, it's turning up in a place where previously they were unknown. Which was very interesting, so he took some samples from that as well. All on the same day. And whilst we were at his house, we were looking through his books, and we came upon <coughs> a, a book called A Naturalist in Carve Anlong by Arawadin Chowdhury, first published in 1993. Now, apparently, uh, Arawadin Chowdhury is a, a renowned Indian mammologist, and he's written several books on uh, the animals of the area. And one chapter in Chowdhury's book was given over to a creature called the Kenwon Po, a yeti like animal seen in. A sap, which means that there are reports of yeti like creatures in a sap between Meghalaya and Bhutan, where of course there are lots of yeti reports. And uh, locally, the creature is called the Kenglong Po. This is in a sap, not Meghalaya. And, uh, <coughs> and uh, he writes about two of his local guides, men he, he <coughs> implicitly trusted who had seen a female King Long Po, which they described as a huge bipedal ape, asleep, leaning against a tree. And they watched it from about 100 feet away, and they, were, they, were man they managed to observe it for quite a long time. And he showed them pictures of the hulok gibbon, and the stump-tailed macaque, and the, uh, the, the sloth bear, and other animals that they could have confused it with, and they were adamant it wasn't this creature, and the elders from the tribe told them that it was the Kenglong Po, which means there is a tradition in Assam, and it links up nicely straight from Meghalaya through Assam to Bhutan. There are stories of these large bipedal creatures. And can we have the next slide, please? Uh, this, this man is uh, a teacher called Kingston. He was another, another man we interviewed in Torah who had seen the tracks of the creature once again on Torah Peak. And he'd been up there with a friend and he heard an ant that animal making a strange cry and we asked him to imitate it. And once again the same noise. <coughs> like all the other witnesses say, it makes the same noise. Um, and he found these huge tracks. And he looked at my size nines and said they were considerably bigger than that. And they, they went very deep down into, into compact, wet sand. He wanted to follow them, but his friend was too, afra uh, too afraid and refused to, uh, refused to follow. We also visited uh, the village of Aparti, some 35 miles from Tura. Uh, to talk to a witness called Nicholas Sama. Uh, can we have the next one, please? There's Nicholas Sama. In the 1960s, he had seen the severed hand and forearm of a Monday morning at a village market where they were selling bush meat. And the arm itself wasn't on sale as food, it was more of a curiosity. It was just the forearm, so that's just your, to your elbow. But he says just that piece was as, as long as his entire arm. And he described it as being covered in dark grey fur. Uh, the hand wasn't bear-like or claw-like at all. It was like a human hand, only very much bigger. Quite long nails. Uh, he believed that the specimen was quite old because it looked desiccated. Uh, it looked like it hadn't been <coughs> ripped. It looked like it had been chopped at the, at the elbow. And it looked very old. It was not the limb of a gibbon or a bear. And he remembers it very well, and the local village elders said it was the arm of the Mandate Maroon. The next day we met with an impressive uh, witness at 
the village of Rombach Key. Can we have the next slide? This man was called Tenga Sangma, and he'd heard uh, back in, in 2004 a village carpenter had seen a Mandai Burung suckling an infant in a bamboo forest close, uh, <coughs> close to the village, and he didn't believe the story at all. Until on the 24th of that month, he and a friend were hunting for jungle fowl uh, in the forest when they came upon a Mandai Burung with its back to them in a sitting position. Even in the sitting position, it was five feet tall. It had massive shoulders and was covered with dark hair. And the hair was longer in the, on the head and fell down the shoulders and the back and it like a sort of mane. It was a female and it was suckling the youngster whose legs were visible at the side, um, as if it was sitting on her, the, its mother's lap. And uh, the mother was reaching up and getting bamboo leaves, pulling them down and eating them while the baby was suckling. And they heard the sort of smacking noise of the baby and the gurgling noise of the infant as it suckled. <coughs> we have the next uh, slide, please. Yeah, it took us down to the area where he saw it. If you see at the back there, there's a sort of uh, rounded place where the vegetation goes in a little bit. That was supposed to be where the animal was sitting. <coughs> Uh, he and a friend got within 50 feet of the two creatures, which hadn't seen them, they were more intent on eating. Uh, and then they got frightened and backed away. Can we have the next slide, please? That's uh, a drawing done by Dave under <coughs> the direction of the witness. You see there, <coughs> the baby is on the lap with its legs sitting out, sucking from the mother who's reaching up and pulling down bamboo leaves to eat. He didn't see it stand up on its hind legs because it was sitting down. Uh, next one, please. We went back to Tora for a while, uh, to the Wangala Festival. Uh, this very jolly and happy looking gentleman there is, is a tribal member. And they, they, they have, uh, it sort of harkens back to the tribal days before Christianity. Um, the Garros were amongst the first people to be. Uh, converted to Christianity um, by the early missionaries because they just thought, oh, if we just tell them we're going to believe in their God, they'll leave us alone, which is more or less what happened. So their culture got preserved reasonably well, and then they have this uh, inter-tribal competition with drummers, dancers, warriors, and so forth. Can we have the next slide, please? There are the drummers. Yeah, and the next slide, please. There's a warrior. They do various dances to represent various parts of Garo life. My favourite being a dance to represent shooting the flies away off rice. And we were guests of honour at the, at the Wangala Festival. Uh, next, please. I'm going to have to uh, rush this one a bit because I've only got about five minutes left. <clears throat> the following day, we met with an impressive witness, and then Nelson Sangma a farmer from the village of San Cisco. He observed a Mande Barun for three days running in 2002. He was some 500 metres from the creature looking down on it. He was on a hill, this was on a smaller hill. When he first saw it, the Mande Barun was standing under a tree. It was around nine feet tall and covered with black hair. It moved around for about an hour and he watched it. It slept in a sort of nest constructed by pulling down branches rather like a gorilla does. The next day he saw the creature in the same place and it appeared to be sunning itself. He watched it for half an hour this time. On the third day he saw it again as it was wandering around foraging. He took some other villagers to the area and showed them the nest. There was a monkey-like smell that pervaded the area and the whole surroundings. They found man-like man tracks 18 inches long and, <coughs> and huge droppings the length of the human forearm. They contained fibres from banana leaves. We switched our attention back to Knockrek National Park, where we went back to the, uh, the, the, uh, the hut we were staying in. During the day's exploration, we came across huge man-like tracks in the sand beside a stream. I believe it was Dave who found them. Was it you who found them first, Dave, or was it John? Yeah, I thought you the first one. Yeah. Yeah. Can we have the next slide, please? That's a stream there, 
And the next one, please. There we are, now. At first, I saw that and I thought, maybe that's a simulacra. It's just a depression that looks like a footprint. But when you looked, you could see where the animal had been walking. And there were other, less well-defined tracks in the grass by it. That was the only decent one where it trod somewhere where it could leave an actual print. Next, uh, please. That's my hands next to it. It was approximately 12 inches long, so large but not massive. So if it was a Yeti, it was probably an immature one. The next one, please. That's my size nines next to it. Now, <coughs> I weigh 18 stone. I could only make a very small impression in that compact earth there. Less than half an inch. That went down two inches, so whatever made it was very, very big. It was a bit too wet to cast it full of water because it was near a stream, which is unfortunate. So we just had to photo it as best we could. Uh, also, along this same stream, it seemed that the animal had been moving along, pulling up rocks and tipping them over as if it were looking for freshwater crabs. And indeed, we found some crabs that had their innards sucked out, as if the animal had gone along, overturned these rocks, grabbed the crabs and sucked the flesh out of them. So, I've got to wrap up pretty sharpish now, so I've not got long left. So, I'm going to curtail it here, but you can talk to me later about it in bar, but what is this animal? Now, the evidence for it is nowhere near as compelling as that for the Orang Pendek. But we have consistent reports of a very big, upright walking animal, like a huge hair-covered man or a colossal gorilla, that walks and moves on its hind legs. Uh, primarily herbivorous, but it takes uh, freshwater crabs as well. These people from very remote hill tribes are all telling the same story, and these stories go back a fair way. I can't conceive of why they would want to lie to us. So if this animal exists, what is it? Next slide. Oh, that's me drinking some uh, some rice liquor. I I regretted that. I was very ill the next day. I, I got terrible deli. The next slide, please. Oh, that's Chris checking the uh, the old camera traps that we we put up in Knockwreck, and we, we came back for them. Unfortunately, they didn't show anything except uh, bushes moving and leaves moving. No huge unknown primates. Next, please. There we are. That was what I was looking for. I always get ahead of myself when I've got slides and things. As far as we know, there is only one primate that was anything like big enough to be the Mandaburum stroke yeti. It's an animal that's known only from its teeth and jaw bones, so it's always a little dodgy to draw too many inferences from something you don't know so well when you haven't got very much of the skeleton, you've only got jaws and teeth. It's called Gigantopithecus black eye. As far as we know, it's the biggest primate that ever lived. Reconstructions of it, if everything was built on the same massive scale as the, as the jaw, means that it would have stood around 10 feet tall. There's some controversy of whether it was a knuckle walker or whether it walked erect. Uh, one theory is that it walked erect due to the shape of the jaws, the flaring at the back of the jaws, meaning the neck bones would be coming down straight, like a sort of toffee apple, or like us, rather than at an angle. If you imagine a lollipop or a toffee apple, you imagine that as the skull, the toffee apple as the skull and the, and the vertebrae coming down directly underneath the head. That's the setup we have. Um, Gigantopithecus may have been the same. It was around until about 300,000 years ago, living alongside animals that are still around today, the great Indian rhinoceros, the panda, the, the, um, the Indian elephant, the tapir. So it may well be that this creature survived and that it still lives in parts of Asia, where it's now known as the Yeti, the Yeren, the Mandeva Rung, and so forth. Can we have the last slide, please? That gives you some idea. That's a human skull, our idea of scale. A human skull, a gorilla skull, and the skull of the Gigantopithecus, which may or may not be the Yeti. 
My gut feeling is that this animal is the Yeti, or if it isn't, it's something very closely related to it. And it's still out there in the wilds of the Garrow Hills, which are incredibly undisturbed. And as I've said, there's a direct link through there, through Assam, to Bhutan, which is positively alive with Yeti reports. So, um, <coughs> guys, do you, did the rest of the team members, do you want to come up for a minute, and if you've got anything to say? <coughs> to add to this and uh, maybe talk a little bit about our next adventure. Yeah, I think we've got time to make a couple of, a couple of questions. Well, John, let me show you. I couldn't go into the detail I wanted to do because of the time. A lot more actually happened, but uh, you'll have to read the book. There we go. Now, these are, these are the people who are going on the Iraq and Deck expedition. There's, there's also five other people who can't be here tonight who are also going. Rich has articulated very well, in my opinion, um, the expedition that we did in India. And if those of you who were in my talk earlier on, you'll contrast what happened in India with what happened in Sumatra. So, what we learn from the people who go out and spend their own time, their own money on these expeditions because they really passionately believe in some of the existence of these creatures is that some of them do exist in very remote areas and it's now time to gather the scientific evidence to, to really prove that they exist. Now, the, what we've learned um, from Sumatra is a gradual refining of approach. So, if we were to go back to India, we just get better and better, and have more and more knowledge, and concentrate and articulate our finds so that we can really prove um, in the same way as we hope to with the Iraq and that the Mandiburg exists. But one final thing on the, on the Iraq and that we are going in three weeks' time, and we're all really grateful that you were here tonight. It's a really exciting time for us as we are about to depart. We've got the best team I think we possibly can in the people here and, uh, and the people who come here. But, but everybody here has got specific expertise. Rich is a great zoologist. Chris is, is a very pragmatic and great observer, observer of people. And John and Dave are both excellent trackers. So really, in the United Kingdom, I think this is the best team we could possibly have. We've got scientific evidence in the past of the Iran Cadet. You heard about the casts and the hairs. Um, that, that, that we had earlier on, and they've been independently, scientifically corroborated. So I think it's fair to say we're all really excited now, because we're on the cusp of, of, of being about to go, and what we've been doing in, in the intermittent breaks is planning that now. So it's a great time for us, and we're all really pleased that you're here to support us. And one day, you might be able to pick up a book on primates, and alongside the gorilla and the orangutan, you'll find the yeti, and you'll find the orang pendek as well. You want to say you want to add anything, guys? No? I think we've um, we might have a better chance of photographing this time too. I think it works out we've got something like 16 uh, trout cameras plus whatever the Australians are bringing. Yeah, well, I don't know how many they're bringing. Between we've got we, we've got up to about 20, I think. Yeah. Right, so. All right. I tell you what, I don't know if anybody's actually mentioned this this weekend. Has anybody talked? Has anybody talked about what then? Yes, I mentioned Glenn in, in, in my previous talk. Okay. I gave him, I gave Glenn specific thanks. I put it on the blogs as well because Glenn worked damn hard to get those, those camera traps. So I did, yes. And some of them are going to be some of them are going to be left with Sahar the guard, and he's going to put them in the jungle and tend to them regularly, go back and, and set them up and find what he's trapped on these cameras. And hopefully, after a bit, we'll get uh, we'll get that hundred thousand dollar shot of the rampant day. Has anybody got any questions? Before you do, I, I think it's really important, us as a team, we, we, we should really give everyone a round of applause here for supporting yeah. us. Okay. So thank you very much. Any questions? Yeah, Rich, where's Greg? Oh, Greg! Bailey's. <laughs> no, it seems to be extremely fruitful. Um, any idea as to the... Um, Affiliations of the Sankuni, you know, it's, it sounds a fabulous dimension. The, the, the Sankuni, is it real or is it just folklore? I don't know. A lot of elements of it are purely folkloric. 
but it could be based on exaggerated um, sightings of some form of very large snake. But wherever we go in the world, we get these stories of huge snakes with crests on their head. It seems to be a motif that comes up again and again and again. And you think if it's, it's purely fiction, it wouldn't be all over the world. You would, it would be in one area. So what is it? We don't know. It's just a baffling mystery. It's much stranger than, than the Yeti, which is a fairly straightforward creature. And incidentally, the bone did turn out to be, much as we thought, uh, the bone of a human. Anybody else? Um, chat there at the back. I'll give you this. Yeah, I know um, everyone up here is not into this, but have you given any thought, if you do find something substantial, how you as an organisation can make any monetary gain so you can fund future expeditions? I know that we're not in it for the money. No, we're not in it for the money, but I hope if we did prove something existed, A, it would get protection because the eyes of the world would be on it, and hopefully it would force the government into doing something to protect it, like the, the Orang Pendek of Sumatra. It's, it's in a national park, but there's still illegal logging and what have So hopefully, it will make them pull their socks up a bit and do something about it. Um, hopefully as well, we would get funding and backing. I mean, I've been trying to get uh, the BBC to do a series, or someone to do a series about cryptozoology, where we go all over the world looking into these creatures and doing it properly, spending months and months looking for these beasts. And uh, I, I got a contact at the, the Bristol Natural History Unit and he said there's no interest at all unless you've got evidence, because they're so tight for money now, they say unless you've got evidence, this catch-22 situation, they're not interested. So if we could get the evidence for the Orang Pendek, A, we might be able to go over there for a longer period, and B, they might look again at other creatures. Uh, just to add to that point, as you well know from talks, I know you've attended them, all of us are, 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 are completely altruistic in the pursuit. It's about preserving the environment, preserving the ecology, and preserving the habitat, and making sure these, these creatures exist. If there is a spin-off in a financial way, it would simply be inputting that money back so that we can try and do, hopefully, positive research elsewhere. So any, any financial um, movement in that sense would, would be purely to preserve other existing cryptids should we find scientific evidence that they exist. But it's a good question, because it's a bold or slightly different. If I just had, if we do get 10 seconds of HD video, or are you can feel actually possible with the equipment we have, I think it would have some sort of fun with that. Could I ask, what is it about the Orang Pendek that compels you to go back? What would it be, the, the sixth time now, or is it the seventh? It's the sixth for, um, for Adam, the fourth for... Uh, myself and Chris, uh, the second for uh, Leah and the first time for John. What compels me to go back is it's such good evidence. We've got a good target area. The national park it's in, um, uh, Karinchi Sadlak National Park, it's actually the size of the country of um, uh, Montenegro. It's a massive national park. In this particular area, it seems to be a hot spot and there are constant reports every year and each time we go back we get good evidence so we're concentrating on this area trying to crack this one one puzzle because the evidence is so compelling and we think if we concentrate there we've got more chance of getting something good getting good positive evidence and then we can look into to moving on to other things as well but we keep going back every few years to to Sumatra because the evidence is so good, it's, it's better than anything else. I think, with the possible exception of the thylus line, it's, it's the cryptid most likely to exist. If I can just add something, because it's been a personal passion of mine for, for a number of years, as you know, and, and when I did my talk earlier on, it's very important to say, yes, we've got some great scientific evidence, it's been, it's been analysed by the evidence that we found historically has been analysed by both primatologists, hair experts, DNA experts, and there's a broad spectrum of scientific opinion by those who've analysed it that it is, a, it is an unknown species. So we're kind of moving away from whether it does exist to, to what it actually is. But the bottom line is, is once it's gone, it's gone forever. So all of us, I think, at the point when we've now, we've, with the exception of John, have actually been to Sumatra, we've all felt the ecological pressure that this area is under, and we really feel like we have to try and do something to preserve the existence of the Orang Pendek before it's gone. No, I don't think 
say further than that? Further than further than that? No, I can't say further than that. Yeah, yeah, I, I, would would add, I would add there's two tests for encrypting. Firstly, that it, it, it exists, and secondly, it is scientifically important. Now, we already know that the iron pen that exists, we've already seen it. So, and, and there's no doubt at all that that's the only other creature discovered by Peter Walker is definitely a scientifically important creature. That, I think, is why we concentrate on this one. And I'm sure everybody in this room will join with me in wishing you all the luck in the world. And I think what they're doing is absolutely fantastic and I'm really, really proud of it.